All right, good evening, everyone. Um, we'll get this underway. Um, it's a great opportunity to, uh, to be here tonight and this evening and just uh, talk about a very important topic. Um, it's certainly uh, very topical at the moment and a lot of conversations being held on this around the country. And hopefully at the end of the day that you learn something new or at least you'll be able to um, go back and, and contribute um, and, and uh, talk more uh, with understanding in this area. So my name's Kevin Cowie. I'm the technical director at Steel Construction New Zealand. And just a little bit about Steel Construction New Zealand. Um, we are the voice of the, uh, the steel industry in New Zealand. We've got a very diverse membership, um, ranges from the mills, the steel suppliers, fabricators, engineers, uh, steel con constructors, and uh, erectors. Um, probably our highest membership is our consulting engineers, probably represent about 50%. 50 and that, this is an area that we provide a lot of guidance and uh, expertise for. As an organization, we're quite small, so it's just four permanent staff, but we do use outside consultants from time to time. Um, there's two professional engineers, and uh, Darren O'Reilly is our general manager. He's here today. And then we have a office administrator, Michelle, who no doubt if you ever attend any of the events would be the one you'd be in contact with. So we're keen uh, to support the steel industry, um, providing guidance uh, and also providing the various events that you can attend and learn from. And one of the areas that we've identified is just in this whole space that we're gonna be covering today. So we're sponsored uh, Don to come over and uh, to cover and uh, explain uh, this, this area. So we work also closely with HERA. Uh, it's a sister organization, it's in the same building as us, and they've been working on a number of sustainability projects. I'll just touch on four of them. Um, they've developed a zero carbon steel program. Um, so that's all up and running. There's information on the HERA website, and it provides a way to reduce your carbon impact through certified and credible offsetting. So that's that's available. Um, Hera has also been working on a material passport um, for steel. And this is really a digital inventory of what's uh, in buildings and to be used for a future stage. So they've been working in that area. Um, Hera has also been working on circular de design research. Um, they got uh, some funding from MB to work on this area. And it's part of their program and looking at construction 4.0. So, um, They've been working not just in New Zealand, but internationally um, with Australia and um, focusing on buildings, but also on bridges. And at the, finally, another area that HERA has been working on is design guidance. Um, they've got funding from Building Research Levy to work on um, low carbon guidance for um, low rise steel and also steel composite construction. So there's gonna be, this work has been done uh, not just in New Zealand, but internationally, and just look out for the space because they're about to, um, you know, uh, get us some workshops and uh, deliver some information that's come out from this research. So with that bit of a background, I'd like to introduce Don. So I've uh, had the privilege of taking Don for the last couple of days, and I've been learning a lot from him. Um, he, uh, from America, he's from a structural engineering background, uh, designing both in America and a number of Asian countries, high rises. But for the last, I think, 15 years or so, you've been focusing in this area um, and developing a lot of expertise, providing a lot of advice um, to various organizations and, um, and developing some standards around that. So I'll hand over to you, Don. Thanks. And... Can you guys hear me? So I haven't used this for this truck, and this would be kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. um, thank, thank you for that. Uh, so yeah, this presentation, I'm going to talk for probably about 45 minutes or so about life cycle analysis and embodied carbon. I'm going to talk about it from a steel lens, but I'm actually just going to talk about development in general. In fact, I'm, and I'm going to step into concrete. I'm going to step into timber. I want to talk about all the materials. How do we use this information to make decisions? It's a quickly moving topic. There's a lot coming into it. And as, as Kevin had said, it's a 
something that started for me as a bit of a passion project that uh, became more of an obsession, and now I find myself doing this full time. Now, a little bit about my background uh, from the United States. I have three kids. I have a super hyperactive dog, and I love to go hiking in the outdoors. So, uh, and where I'm from in Seattle is actually not feels a lot like the the environment around here. So, you guys have a beautiful place. Um, my professional practice, though, I've been for most of my career, last 35 years, I've been part of a, a practice called Magnus and Clemensic Associates. Uh, and for the last 10 years, I've been the president of MKA. So a preeminent US structural practice where my most of my work was international. In fact, I looked at my passport uh, one time and I had 10 years with a stamp every single month somewhere in Asia to, to kind of give you a flavor of where I'm spending my time. Um, these are a number of projects of mine. So I, I it's not a just a steel guy or a concrete guy or a timber guy. I, I work in all the materials. I started talking and focusing on embodied carbon as another way to tell the steel and structural optimization story. How, what we do if we do a better job as engineers, uh, we optimize the materials, we can, it's a win-win scenario for our owners to, to save money. How could I tell that from a sustainability story where saving money, saving carbon, saving material was all one of the same stories. That's what got me on the journey. Uh, that started in the US, we founded a group called the Carbon Leadership Forum about 15 years ago as a nonprofit to be a center to work on this life cycle space. And I honestly probably spent with a very small cluster of people about 10 years looking at a mirror, talking about this topic, trying to figure out where to go. There was, really wasn't that much activity about it. Three or four years ago, we then launched another effort to make a uh, national database EC3 in the United States, where we collected all of these environmental product declarations, which I'll talk about in a little bit more, into one place, kind of like a nutrition label of, of our materials, put it in one place, put it in a database, make it free, give the data away. The idea being, let's not compete on the data, let's compete on the ideas of where the data goes and uh, use that data to help make informed decisions, inform our clients. The tech industry picked up on it um, because they like data and they see it as a dis, uh, disaggregated industry that uh, we didn't have that good control of it. So uh, launched another nonprofit building transparency that in the US really has helped drive this explosion in the low carbon space with the use of environmental product declarations. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Where I find myself right now is I've stepped down from MKA. I'm now as an in, working independently, but focusing 100% on decarbonization of materials. And I've been betting myself in, with different development clients, with asset management uh, efforts, with uh, public policy, um, trying to help advance, at least for the rest of my career, how we act on this topic. So we're at least trying to get more on the same page. So we at least are using the same language, we're having the same conversation. And so that's where I met Darren, that's where I met Kevin, and I find myself here talking to you. Um, so I'm going to start with a little bit of a personal confession and a question. Has anybody in here ever measured your own personal carbon footprint? There's a lot of on online tools that can help you do it. Have, perfect. What's that? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is mine using one of the uh, you know, online tools, and I'm not so good. I am four times the US average. I'm 10 times the international average for my personal carbon footprint. Now, I live in a city that's fairly green. So we have a green electrical grid for what we do. I have solar panels on my house. I drive an electric car. I take mass transit. But I'm also on airplanes. And what totally drives my carbon footprint is all the flights that I do for running around. Uh, in fact, even coming to places like being here. But and maybe this is moral self-justification, but it, uh, I use this to help explain what we do as consultants, especially as structural engineers of the built environment. We make decisions that can uh, involve huge volumes of material, huge carbon footprints. After I did this exercise, I went and measured a building that we had designed that I was part of, a tall uh, high rise on the West Coast of the US. And I compared it to another high rise of a similar program done by a competitor, and it doesn't even matter what the building is. Just on the concrete and steel alone, there was 300 years of my carbon footprint difference, the carbon footprint between these two buildings. 
between the program and one that was optimized and one that really wasn't. Think about how many jobs, how many projects you work on in your career, how many you will work on in your career, and the impact you have and the ability you have to make a change on the carbon footprint of what we do. The point is just we, um, what we do in our profession, there, there's significant implications just because of the amount of materials that get used, much more than what our daily carbon footprint is, although we all need to work on it and, and improve what we are doing. Now, um, I know how many of you have been in Dubai before. This is uh, Dubai Creek. And uh, these are two pedestrian bridges, two functionally equivalent structures over the same waterway. And I use this to, to make a point about uh, efficiency in systems. These are two be beautiful works of art. They're both structural steel structures. We're looking at this tight arch. They're actually designed by the same architecture practice and the same engineering practice. I, I was not involved in either of these. But when you, when you look at this beautiful uh, bridge right here and you compare it to this uh, Berendale Truss uh, spiral, he spiral he helix, don't look too close at the welds. Uh, welding into Dubai is uh, maybe a little different conversation. But the point I want to make, when our clients bring problems to us, when their clients bring challenges to us for what we're doing, what solutions do we lead them towards? What options do we put on the table for them? Between these two bridges, that Verndale Trust has 20 times the amount of steel in it. And that's actually being a conservative calculation, but just looking at the, the, the moment at arms and the stiffness that has to go into those. Programs are the same. They're both works of art. When the architect or the client asks you, can you think for a moment and respond with, well, yes, I can, but should I, or should you? So it usually leads you to a very different solution and, and it stimulates a conversation in what we're doing. This, this type of thinking, you know, we have wonderful tools today that we can do amazing design and, and analytical tools. How do we use that and what solutions do we choose to solve with those problems? Now, I love to bring biomimicry into my projects to, to also help explain things. And usually, if we are coming up with solutions that we find an answer for somewhere in nature, there's a good chance we actually might be onto something, doing it right. But does anyone know what this is? Just curious what this is a picture of. That's a cross section of a, it's a bird wing is what we're looking at. Bird bone is much heavier and denser than human bone on a on a per material basis but that is a highly highly optimized element structural element all the materials at the extreme fiber where it's doing the most work material has been taken away uh in the middle and the overall structure is a quite elegant lightweight uh even though it's using heavy materials but it's being very strategic where those materials are being placed so i'm going to think of that analogy for a moment and i'm going to talk about a building Sometimes our answers for optimization efficiency, we'll find answers looking backwards as much as we do looking forward. This is Puget Sound Plaza, 1962 building in Seattle that I stared out of my window all the time that was done by my, my forefathers in our practice. And um, decisions that were made on this style of a building because of necessity, because they had to design it with a slide rule. They didn't have computers, they didn't have, and, but, it's a very clean building, clean load path, 60 foot clear spans, column free interior. Every beam goes to a column straight to the foundations, no transfers. 12 drawings describe the entire project or the structural design of the building. Four, I think there's a total of eight beams that are over 90% of all of the, the beams that are in this project. But every beam that happened, the details were sweated to a really, really deep level of analysis and design. In fact, this was the very first ever castellated uh, composite beam project that was done. So the top flanges are smaller than the bottom flanges. The top flanges are were done compositely with a concrete slab. And like I said, it's a 60-foot clear span building. This is a 60-year-old building that clearly has another 60 to 100 years of life in it because it's the way it's being maintained. It was designed from the beginning with um, functional adaptability, and uh, it's uh, it's still you know a very successful project in Seattle for for what it is. 
sometimes some of these answers, you know, why did they do that compared to what, think about that and decisions that were made to come up with a building like that compared to what we do today in our, in our design practice. Now, there are current versions of that same kind of beams today. This is the Angelina beam from ArcelorMittal, but we typically aren't using these in our practice that much because there's a lot of labor that goes into constructing these things. And the highly optimized, the most efficient building for our clients is typically today optimized for least labor, more material. Material is relatively cheap compared to labor. That's the, that's the balancing equation that, that informs our doing good design, rightfully so. But the point being, if that equation starts to change, there's a lot of opportunity for optimization in what we do as engineers. When we start to pay attention to carbon, some of the, our decisions may start to change a little bit of how we're doing things. Uh, now, again, uh, some of these timeless ideas coming forward. Um, this building on the left is the IBM building in Pittsburgh, also done in the 60s designed with a slide rule. It's the first bearing wall diagrid building that was ever done. The colors that you're looking at there are different grades of steel. Now this was uh, John Skilling and Yamasaki that did this. Uh, Yamasaki is the architect and uh, the steel frame was exposed, but all the pieces had to be exactly the same size. So what you're seeing is different grades of steel that they colored them different to make sure they got put in the right places. Now, architects today would probably figure out some way to celebrate that, and we'd see the big mosaics on our building. In this case, it was all painted white, and you really don't see it. But I was fascinated when I recently saw this picture of an F-150 truck where they're optimizing to use least material to reduce the weight, and they're using different grades of steel at different places in the truck, whether it's in the crash protection or in the structural frame. Some of these ideas are timeless on how we can bring these into our design process for just material optimization. Now, if there's anything else that comes out of this conversation today, um, and I'll bring this uh, guide up again at the very end. Um, if you don't remember anything else, just remember this. Everybody has a homework assignment. You have to go download this guide because it's free and it's extremely helpful from how to make decisions using embodied carbon. And much of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this presentation at LC is actually what's in this guide. Heinz is an international development client from the US that I do a bunch of work with. Um, they're quite active in Europe. They're uh, active throughout the APEC regions. But they came to me and because they, they knew my presence and what I was doing in this carbon space. And they said, Don, we're building buildings for Salesforce and Amazon and Microsoft, and these clients are pushing us. They're pushing us on carbon. They're challenging us to do things. And the governments or by clean legislations are trying to, starting to push us to do things. And we're reacting. We're reacting uh, to these, this coming to us. We don't like that. We're developers. We want to be out in front. We want to be leading. Help us figure out how to lead. How do we start using this information to be proactively making decisions where we're leading these tenants and clients to a solution, we're actually ahead of everyone else in following. So that started a two year effort in the writing of this guide to take a very mature class A developer, international developer, take their decision-making process of how they look at assets, how they make decisions through a design process and how to bring carbon into that metric for decision-making process. And then, uh, make it in an approachable way that we could then, they could explain it internally to their asset managers and their, their uh, construction and development managers. In fact, much of what I've been doing over the last year is running around teaching this guide to the development managers at Heinz. Asking about carbon now is, and carbon expertise is a big part of who they pick for their consultants who get the projects. And so I wanna walk you through a little bit what's here just because it's a very thoughtful, way to act on making, making a decision-making process. Um, yeah, well, I'll just go into more details as we go. So there's, there's several de decision points that come out of the way of this, and it's really just the typical design process. Here, I'm going to highlight four, and I'm going to really just talk about two. But decisions that we make in the concept to schematic design phase and how carbon can or cannot, what, how do we use potentially use this information for early design decisions. And then I'm gonna spend some time talking about procurement and carbon accounting. But the, the, if there's a fundamental part of 
life cycle analysis and bringing in body carbon into this conversation, treat it like dollars, tie it to cost estimates. Come And, and it's not a one-time look on a project. What we really need to do at concepts and schematic design, we need to be estimating uh, our material quantities. Then we need to come up with a, a create a baseline building that's of a carbon budget. And then it's really about simply managing to a budget, checking ourselves against where we were at the start. And if we're off, why? Was it because the architect made the building really complicated? Did the owner made some loading changes or other things that, or did we just not do a good job in our design and optimization? have an answer and, or maybe we just guessed and had the wrong estimate at the start. But if that's the case, we'll then learn from that and let's, let's get better. So it's just about, you know, pursuing a very risk managed design managed process where we're not flying blind in what we're doing and carbon comes into decision making. Now the mass in this life cycle analysis and carbon accounting is really simple. LCA has lots of rabbit holes and lots of places for people to get really, really confusing and really make this complicated. Resist that urge. Always pull it out. When you're finding yourself getting down into a rabbit hole, focus on the 80%, not the 100%. Get 80% of it right. Make some simplifying assumptions. Document it and move forward. But just know at the end of the day, this is all we're doing. Material quantities times the global warming potential of that material to come up with embodied carbon. Uh, and this is for what we would call the upfront carbon model of a building. Now, upfront carbon modeling, that's accounting. It's carbon accounting. And I, I want to make that distinction compared to whole life carbon, where life cycle analysis, you have to bring the life cycle part of it. That means time needs to come into it. And in the most simplest way to describe it, time has to be in the denominator in some way. Now, maybe we're going to pick a, uh, well, I'll, I'll explain that. Just, just keep that in mind. There are actually two different calculations. They're different numbers. And people often confuse these, these terms. They'll do an upfront carbon model and they'll call it a life cycle analysis. It's really not. That's carbon accounting. It's a carbon model of the building. And I'll explain that a little bit more here. Now, um, when we're talking about whole life carbon, uh, whole building life cycle analysis, um, ISO has created these standards and these different buckets of how to measure. What's beautiful about this is it's a holistic way to look at a building. Everybody's got a bucket. Everyone's got a home. We may not know all the answers in some of these buckets. We may have to be making assumptions and filling in some of these holes, but they're ever, everyone has a place. What about that end of life? Well, what about the use phase? Well, in whole building LCA, you have a place to account for this. But when we're trying to look at the whole picture, what we may be able to measure pretty accurately in the A1 to A3, from resource extraction to the factory gate, that may be actual measurements. We measure our quantities, we get, EP, we get uh, carbon data. That's a measurement we can do. If we do our analysis though, before construction started, we're making some estimates. We're projecting of something of data that we don't really know. And certainly when we talk about the use stages and the end of life stages, we're speculating on the future. My point with it is whole building LCA by definition is an inexact science. And it's, we're projecting, we're making estimates out in the future. We do this all the time with cart with dollars. We do pro forma modeling and estimating. This is where we need to be treating carbon like dollars, but we also need to get comfortable with uncertainty and talking about the uncertainty and what we do and what we don't know in these numbers. And frankly, many times, Cart, we may not know enough to make a, de a definitive decision based on the quality of the data we have. A lot of times, especially those early studies and concepts and schematics, the carbon model may help us be directionally accurate. But when someone's giving you an LCA to eight decimal places based on a schematic model, first thing you do is go back and uh, ask, ask you know, who did the model and uh, tell me where the numbers and We're not that accurate on the numbers. Um, this is a nice graphic that's in the, that Heinz guide that I used to try to explain what I was just talking a little bit ago about upfront carbon and life cycle model carbon. Upfront carbon is we're measuring the structure, the skin, all the different pieces that is in that A1 to A3 category. And yes, structure typically is the biggest portion of it, probably 60 to 70% of the total. It's the right place to have the conversation because it's 
in just a few materials, concrete, steel, glass, or, you know, CMU, you can make the biggest difference on the carbon footprint of the whole building. Often, once we've decided we've hit the program and what the building's going to be, getting the materials right is an appropriate place to practice to try to lower that carbon footprint. It's why it's good that we as structural engineers have to have a role in the space. Um, but that upfront model compared to a life cycle model where time has to come in, I either need to go out to a boundary condition, let's say maybe 60 years, and I'm measuring at 60 years, or I may take that 60 years and amortize it back to a yearly number, but time comes into it. It's a different calculation. Now in the Heinz guide, you are going to be required, you have to do both calculations. But the reality is, is if you're doing a life cycle carbon model, the upfront carbon data is in your numbers. It's, it's an easy extraction out. So it's actually quite easy to report both if, you, if you're doing the one. But in that life cycle, we need to make some decisions. Well, if I measure at 60 years, but I've done a building that is capable and I totally anticipate that that building should be able to last for 100 years, what do, how do I deal with that residual value afterwards? Asset managers, and there's a way to handle this in dollars. This is why we, but, but we have to have answers. And we, the key here is we need to be consistent about it. And that's what we really don't have settled in the industry right now is how to be consistent about these, these measurements. If I have a, maybe it's the services, the mechanical systems or interiors that I are going to change several times between the upfront and that 60 year boundary condition that I measure at, okay, I might, do I need to multiply times three? Is there a discount rate that should be getting used on the time value of carbon? Um, this is a, you know, I just grabbed it. Your uh, CSOC uh, sustainability task force has got some re a really excellent article in your April issue on, on exactly this topic. And that's where that graphic came out of. This is something we haven't settled as an industry on how to handle that. It's probably somewhere around that yellow curve that carbon emitted today should be higher than carbon emitted in the future. But there's uh, whether you do a straight line, which of these lines, it's not really set yet. Uh, the RICS guide uh, in, out of the UK probably does it better than anybody right now on trying to explain this, but the, it needs to be simplified. It's too complicated what's in there right now. Uh, but it's one of these things we need to make decisions on. And this is an evolving space. You know, we, I, I'll, you, I would be lying if I said we had it all figured out. Um, there are pockets of excellence that know exactly how to do this. But the problem is the pockets of excellence around the world don't necessarily do it the same. And so this is, this is kind of where we are in, in the industry right now is trying to create alignment of these, but at least we're starting to articulate what is the, what is the problem we're trying to solve and how are we trying to solve it? Now I'm gonna use, this is the San Diego airport terminal uh, project that I uh, recently was part of. It's under construction right now. And I'm gonna use it as an example of what the data looks like if you're doing some of these things that I'm, that I'm talking about. It's a structural steel frame. It's on a liquefiable soil site. We're on deep pile foundations. It's, in a, it's close to the bay. So the, there's a lot of saline, uh, wa salty water uh, below the site. So there's corrosive soils, what it means for the piles. Um, but in this project, we did a very attentive effort to track and monitor our quantities from the beginning. At the, at the, base, at the very start of the project, we estimated and what I'm showing you here is it, each of the different milestones where we, where we did a snapshot. We tried to track where we were on the project. The whisker bars is an, a, a uh, let's call it best available science effort to report the uncertainty in the data, both the uncertainty on the quantities plus the uncertainty on the carbon data that's being used. Just to give a flavor of you know, how accurate is this information of, uh, of, that we're looking at. That drop from the baseline to the 30-year 30, 30 drawings, we switched from a moment frame to a braced frame and uh, opened, opened up some things on some flexibility. So there was some change in the program. There was some optimization, design things that went up and went down. But I want to look at the very end here where when we got to 90% drawings, where we're going out to tender with the project, we're going out to bid. The program had been based on a 60-year building. That's what we've been asked to design. That's what the design team ran all the calculations on. And I asked the question, I said, what if we change the life of the building simply from 60 years to 100 years? What do we have to do? 
what do we have to what does it mean from a seismic calculation probabilistic the seismologist we did perform in space engineering on the building but the seismologists raised their hands 60 200 years i don't know it, it was it's a pretty nominal increase but what really was the fatal going to be the fatal issue for this building was our piles which had a 60 year design life on the corrosion around the piles so the question is, if we extended the useful life of those piles, we made them 100-year piles instead of 60-year piles, it turned out to be an extra half-inch concrete cover on all the piles. It was basically a no-cost ad to give the building the potential to go from a 60-year to 100-year design life. And we had built in a lot of flexibility in the building for planned functional adaptation. The cladding system was all bolted connections. There's no welding in it. So it could be assembled and disassembled and changed with time. We figured out load paths for when the mechanical systems would be changed and, and the load paths that we didn't have to bring helicopters in to take things in and off, you know, how, how we would be able to disassemble and get things out of the building. So we gave the building the ability to have this adaptability to extend it. But just by simply making the piles last longer, we had the potential to change the carbon footprint narrative from an LCA perspective to drop it by 39%. That's a pretty big deal for what was almost a, a no cost add to the building. And the client was like, yeah, I want to do that. Um, so it, LCA was a way for us to communicate the impact of this. And it's a plus or minus. There's still some pretty big range in the numbers. It's not an exact number, uh, but we were able to make a directionally accurate informed decision to, to help make a value proposition on a building. Now I'm gonna use this for a couple other examples of where the data can come in that this is an office building in Seattle that we did for Skanska at my prior practice. And um, I just wanna talk about intentionality of choices and building for permanence or disassembly. There's a lot of discussion about building for disassembly and circular economy thinking, but we need to be very intentional where we do that. And so the choices we may make in a tower say where when I build this tower, it's going to be there longer than my life. I'm building it for 100 years plus life for sure. So things as simple as composite construction or not, absolutely, it's going to be a composite construction where I'm tying the top flange into the steel frame. Now, when I try to disassemble that tower, you're not going to get those beams out simply. You're, they're going to be damaged in a way that the reuse of that steel is going to go back to the mill and you're going to have to remelt the beam down and go reuse it at some future date. Um, but it's a highly optimized building where I'm tying everything together because I'm building for permanence. I've, I have adaptability in the building for functional adaptability as much as we could program into it, but I'm going to optimize the building that way. That's a different conversation though than say maybe at the ground plane where the retail I know is going to change every 20 and the program is very likely to be adapted and need to change. That's a location to talk about. Maybe let's use an all bolted frame that is not composite construction. So where it can be assembled and disassembled and reassembled in some different ways to because I know the program is going to change in some time. And so even though there might be some more steel or more other structural materials in that upfront solution, all the pieces of the building are absolutely being built to, that they can be reused. So maybe that's a CLT floor system on steel with non-composite steel framing. And uh, just think of the, the point here being, these are choices we make in our design. Don't leave it out to chance. We can help steer where some of this can go in the future. If we make it easy and economical, to do this disassembly, it's probably has a pretty good chance that that's exactly what a, a developer is going to do. And they're going to have less of a stranded asset and you can start having conversations with them about the, the uh, reusability of the value, the value hold of the project over time. But, uh, you know, but this is also about bring these decisions to your client, let them make an informed choice, but give them the options of where that can go. Now, another building I want to uh, show just kind of for, for a little bit of the fun of it. Um, we're looking at a soccer ball here, this five-sided uh, shape. Um, this is, was the inspiration behind the Amazon spheres, if any of you have been to Seattle. That shape, um, curving in two directions, repeats itself again and again and again throughout that soccer ball orb. 
Well, that's exactly what we ended up doing in, in the uh, Amazon spheres is we came up with a, this Catalan shape that is, you know, there's a lot of things that went into the optimized sizing and, and shaping of that, including how big of a piece of tube steel could be bent uh, in the fabrication process. And that's, that is, you know, that, that TIE fighter is, you know, that's exactly the Catalan that got built. It's pretty complicated, but that the entire structure is that one piece repeated again and again and again. So the fabricator was able to set up jigs and set up a very exacting process with a very low waste on what they, what they ultimately were pulling together for the structure to what becomes the spheres. And it's, it's that same shape, just kind of re re coming together at the nodes. Now, the other part I really like about this picture, the, the spheres here is that picture on the right, where when we look at that external steel skin, that's a four for one solution. The steel that went into that, you know, yes, it's a work of art, it's a, it's a high cost, but it's the gravity system, it's the lateral system, it's the cladding backup system, it's the architectural statement without other adornment. And it creates a very highly functional, flexible space for future uses. But it's also built for permanence. That is the part that stays. The internal part of the spheres is very intentionally also quite adaptable in choice of materials and choice of program, quite adaptable and flexible in program that can change and it can adapt with time. It's a very intentional choice. It wasn't by accident that we got there. That was a very intentional decision-making process and the choices that we ended up with the solution in terms of what it was. Now, um, decision point two procurement. This is really where the EPD conversation comes into it. Um, environmental product declarations, kind of like, a, like I said, is kind of like a nutrition label where we're, we're picking uh, the, the purpose of these EPDs is asking for carbon data at the time, just before money changes hands, going out to procurement. It's in a really powerful tool for, to make a demand side signal of what we're valuing for double bottom line accounting, to get fabricators and uh, material suppliers to pay attention and to create a competition where we can look at cost and carbon at the same time. And frankly, let our developers make informed choices on where to be carbon aggressive or where to not be carbon aggressive based on the data that before we've actually had to make that choice. Now, um, this is the steel product category rule in the US. Product category rules are created, um, they're the rules by which EPDs need to get made. But the steel EPD is made by the steel industry. The concrete EPD is made by the concrete industry. The timber EPD is made by the timber industry. They're not the same. They don't measure the same variables. They don't look at the data in the same way. We shouldn't be trying to compare. You don't take the timber EPD, compare it to the concrete EPD, compare it to the steel EPD. The data is not compatible. That's not really the intent of the use of these EPDs um, because they're not following the same product category rules. There's different boundary conditions that are, that are getting measured. Now, typically an EPD uh, there's, uh, this is the U S version of it. There's in the industry average EPD that's published by AIC for the steel industry. We could be using this early on des in design when we don't know who the supply chain is. Ultimately though, we want to be act asking for the vendor specific EPD. Um, that's a third party verified element that tells us, you know, exactly what for the, from the material supply chain that's coming through. For steel, it's really all about the mill. 80% of the issue is, is it an electric arc furnace? Is it a blast furnace? What's the carbon footprint of the energy coming through the mill? The EPD is the way for that to get reported. Now, like when you're looking at a shop drawing or another submittal, uh, it's important on those EPDs, what PCR was followed? And when you're gonna go compare two EPDs, are they using the same PCR? Is it valid? PCRs and EPDs have about a five-year shelf life uh, and for, for the validity of what that is. So they need to be constantly refreshed. Um, is it a valid EPD? Was it third-party verified? There's like, these are like three fundamental checks that should typically happen when for whoever's kind of down in the details, extracting this data and working with it uh, in these comparisons. Now, uh, the steel EPD in the U.S., includes fabrication in the reported number, even though it's largely a mill EPD and they use industry average data for the fabricator. 
And the reason we've done that in the US is the fabrication numbers 10, 15% of the total. And actually, if there's a if it's a high carbon footprint or a low carbon footprint of fabrication, that's probably more of a sign of what we did as engineers and how complicated of a design did we ask the fabricator to do than it is about the fabricator's carbon footprint. Um, if, if they're just getting straight beams and punching holes in it versus a highly welded shape, it's a very different conversation. But, and because it's really a driver about what's happening at the mill, uh, the EPD that gets reported, there's actually both numbers are reported. So you can kind of see the range of what it would be. And for the fabricator that wants to do better than the average, absolutely. If they want to go calculate their own carbon footprint and report that through and show a better, more aggressive number that, than what's here, they have every right to do that. And that might be a, a differentiator for them. But uh, like I said, steel is largely the big driver is the mill. Simplifying assumption to let the fabricators off the hook and just use the at the industry average number. That's this is generally what's happening in the U.S. production on it. Uh, the steel industry is actually well primed and in a really good position to start bringing this data transparency and disclosure through the system because we already do it with mill certs. When as an engineer, when I'm designing a building and and I I can find out very quickly, I get a bill of material quantities. Frankly, the steel quantity data is usually some of the best in the industry. It's better than what gets reported for some of the other materials to, to get hold of it early. And the mill cert, I know where it comes from. I can get I can get different pieces of data. We're just asking for a little bit more information, frankly, in some ways. In, in terms of the carbon footprint that gets added to that. But there's an there's a inventory control process that isn't that different that already exists for what we're doing with the EPDs. So it's relatively straightforward for the steel industry to react on this. And in, in the US, for sure, it has in that way. But I want to talk about more than just steel. So let's talk about concrete for a moment in, in some similar ways. And concrete, a lot like the steel industry, already has an inventory control process that comes through it. We get batch tickets. In those batch tickets, it tells me where the cement came from. I know where the aggregate supply came from. There's a there's a documenting of the inventory flow through the system. EPDs are really just an extension of that process. I mentioned this EC3 tool in the US that we created. When we launched that tool a little over three years ago, there were 800 concrete EPDs in the United States for concrete across the across the country. Today, we have over 70,000 EPDs on the concrete in that database. I mentioned this just on, this is how fast this topic is moving and, and how fast that reaction is. But now we have this wealth of data of concrete mixes, uh, on-demand EPDs that we can start looking and understanding the, the, the variations. Why is there variations in this plant versus another plant? There's a lot of data-rich information we can start mining. Um, now, the reason we've been able to do that in the concrete industry is what happens is some smart people have uh, figured out how the batch plant tickets work, and they go into the batch plant, they audit a year's worth of throughput at the batch plant, and based on that yearly audited data, they assign numbers to the aggregate, to the cement, to the, to the sand that's coming through the batch plant because it's on a yearly annual. And just like as soon as the batch ticket is controlled, you know exactly how much quantities in a mix went into a, a particular design, you can get an on-demand EPD. And what happens right now, it's been digitized. And so that on-demand EPD is created. And when the batch ticket is issued, it actually goes up into, into the cloud and shows up on our database 48 hours later after a screening process on, uh, on a, uh, does it have the verification process? So part of the reason we get in this explosion is we can now get EPDs on demand for every mix that comes out of a batch plant. Um, and, but uh, so the concrete industry has totally jumped on top of this topic and has given us a lot of information. Um, the problem in concrete though, and I can, I, I don't know about you guys, but for me, there's an explosion in the material science space. In some ways, it's exciting to see. With, with concrete, there's a lot of new low carbon alternatives coming into the system. We don't have a material science problem with low carbon concrete. What we have is it's just such a large scale volume of material that gets used. We have an inventory control and delivery problem 
to be able to consistent and reliably deliver all these new materials. And one of the biggest problems, our batch plants aren't geared for all these additional silo spaces you would need for all these different materials that are coming through the system. So even though the material science may be out there for some really novel new low carbon offerings, we don't really have a system geared to deliver this through. And this is one of the challenges and in industry upgrades, frankly, that is coming about with this new, these new next generation materials is figuring out how to actually make the batch plants work better. Now, uh, wood, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. This is one of the T3 projects for Heinz. I've done about 10 of these for them. So um, they, they've built, this is an eight story office building mod, model that they've, they've built a number of across the country. Um, but one of the challenges I have with wood, is we talked about all these EPDs in the steel and the concrete, in the US especially, we don't have that sourcing disclosure transparency in the same way through the system. In the US, we have one EPD for all of North America. And they use one number for the carbon footprint of timber and it's all the same, it's all the same. Where it came from, well, we don't really wanna talk about that because that's hard to measure. That's, that's the narrative that we have today. The reality is the timber industry, which is really controlled by the mills, wants to keep the material as a commodity because they don't want the differentiation because they wanna buy as cheap a commodity as they can they want to make it into a product and then they want to sell that product in the differentiation, but differentiation upstream of the mill, where what I really would like to do is be able to value the landowners that do a better job, that, that have different forestry practices, that find a way to reward them. That's a disincentive for the money making mechanism for the mill. So that's part of the tension that's happening in the US right now. But this picture on the left is, um, this is from a predictive modeling tool that the Forest Service uses. This is for the Pacific Northwest 10-acre uh, plot where they were looking at the differences between a 40-year and an 80-year harvest rotation. And every major uh, commercial forestry landowner has some version of this kind of software. They know very well how fast the trees, when they replant and how fast it's gonna grow. This is how they do their own predictive modeling. But what we do today we measure the dark brown, which is the merchantable lumber, the harvestable product that comes through the throughput. That dark brown, we call that carbon negative, and we ignore everything else. That's a big zero. We call it that, we just call it as a zero. Now, 40 years is a rotation optimization for economic throughput because there's constant flow coming through the system. An 80 year rotation actually produces more total mass of wood in the tree than a 40 year rotation, but it's less efficient for a mill operation. The trees are of different sizes. It doesn't, doesn't, work, it doesn't work quite as well. 80 years is kind of what you get if someone's following FSC. Um, 40 years in the US is what you get if it's SFI is, is kind of a bit of the difference. I'm not a forester. I'm not the one to interpret this graphic of how to use it and how this information should come into what we do. And, and honestly, the, as I've spent time here, I'm not sure we as the design community need to be, there should be the police. But what I do know is there's more going on here than zero. And if we're trying to create a process that rewards those that do better, as a minimum, we need to have disclosure and transparency coming through the system of the sourcing of what happens, where the material came from. And I'll, I'll leave the judgments of what's good and what's bad to someone else, but I at least want to be seeing that disclosure coming through the system if we're going to be playing on the same, on the same uh, level with everybody. Now, this is from a, a group of scientists, a report that came out last year from World Resources uh, Institute. I thought their statement was restrained, but actually quite accurate when they say, our review finds that the broad interest in mass timber has been based on incomplete carbon accounting. I think that's a, that's a good way to put it where we are right now. We don't have the whole story. We don't necessarily know the whole story. Timber is doing a good job of not wanting to tell the transparencies through it. EPDs don't tell it, but what, what we've started putting into our bid documents and getting our clients like Heinz to do is something that's actually where Europe's going right now is a start. Two questions. I wanna know when it was cut and I wanna know where it was cut. And actually, if you just ask those two questions, if you really want to go look, satellites can tell you the rest uh, and monitoring what happens on the forest land over time. But what we've, what we've done with Heinz is we ask those two questions, the when and the where, 
we ask a couple of other basic questions on forest land practices to have it defined. And then in the bidding process in a big project, I tell them to go hire a forestry consultant to compare the bids. So the two bids that come into them from two different suppliers, if they're coming from different forest streams, let, the, let, a for, let an expert on that topic evaluate the bids for the goods and the bads and the variations between them. And if that comes into a decision process, but as a minimum, there's sourcing disclosure and transparency through the system, similar to what you get in steel, similar to what you get in concrete. And I, th I think my, my biggest criticism on timber, timber has the potential to do wonderful things, but we need a trust but verify that's better in the system. And I think our part as designers is we need to take that extra step to actually make sure that transparency is coming through the system, even if we're not the experts to be the ones to be, be the police or making the judgment calls on it. Um, the Climate Smart Wood Group, which I'm on the leadership council for in the US, um, is a good place that helps give us some guidance on this and in, in some specifications and in uh, procurement guidance to where you can start asking some of these questions and try to at least create some education of like, what is the framing of the challenge? And frankly, the science is not settled yet that we really don't even know. In many ways, I don't know how to value the time part of carbon in trees versus the upfront with the carbon and steel. There is a type of LCA, I'll, I'll just say it for a moment, dynamic LCA is a tool of how to do that. But it's, it's something that really is only in the academic space right now and the variables in it are way, way too complicated to try to bring it into an actionable tool that we use during design. So there is a science of how to try to make that evaluation. It just needs to be greatly simplified before it's coming to us for what we're doing. And, and that's, that's not really a settled space yet. Um, looking closely in New Zealand here though, um, Woodspan, uh, I was really impressed with some of, some of the manufacturing that I do see happening here in your mass timber. What I like about their PLT panels, they're calling, they're fiber optimized. So in a floor system, we have all the fibers going in the same direction. It, and it's an engineered product uh, with the, the fingerling joints. There's, there's less flaws in the material. You get higher bending stresses. You can do more work with less fibers, less material. In fact, if we really want to get into the bio-based design, if you want to take it to another level that we're just starting to explore, just, just think hard about the term fiber optimized design and what does that mean? Uh, whether that's in connections, whether that's in the base material itself, even what type of fibers we're building with. There are stronger fibers than, than pine and there's different grades of, 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 of wood. And let's, what about bamboo? What about hemp? There's a lot of other materials that we might start mixing some of these materials together to come up with some really exciting ideas that we're just barely probably starting to explore and play with as an industry. Now, I, I show this here just as a, um, I was recently challenged by Amazon looking at some of their distribution centers in the US. And the question was, what's the lowest carbon distribution center shell that we could be doing compared to what we're doing today with their concrete tilt up walls? And this is, this is where we ended in that study for them. But what I really wanna emphasize more than anything in here, this is a hybrid structure. It's not all one material or another. It has a concrete foundation, we got steel open web joists, we got steel columns, we got wood for the decking system. Um, but I also told Amazon, you can't stop here. It's not just about picking the materials. You also have to take it to that next step of procurement and where did it come from? In fact, the Amazon, I know uh, we were just, I was talking to uh, Wayne uh, Carson yesterday and he was telling me about a project for Amazon that they just bid on. And I smiled because he was describing a, a bidding document that we had worked on in Seattle, where the bid from Amazon said, here's our design, here's the building we want, fabricator, give me your lowest price that gives me the building I'm after, and tell me the carbon footprint of that building, but lowest price with these rules of what I want, and then give me your lowest carbon possible offering you could give me for the same building, and tell me what that price is. I want two numbers. And then what it did is initiated a conversation, it initiated a conversation where they started looking at the supply chain. Now for one, because Wayne knew the client was caring about carbon, he strategically picked what mills he went and got the material from. 
And so there were solutions, there were only certain solutions coming through the system that were already a lower carbon offering to start with, which is a good thing. But then Amazon also was put into a position they could start making an informed choice of where they where in the system that they want to be more or less carbon aggressive uh, before they actually are spending the money. That's exactly this what this EPD process is to do, where in how carbon evaluation comes into this. And it's not concrete versus timber versus steel. That was all about concrete and concrete, steel and steel, timber and timber to actually drive drive things down at the procurement point for who was going to be lowest carbon. So talking just a little bit more about steel, obviously recycling is, is such a big part of the steel story for what we do. And um, this is an interesting graphic that AISC was putting out last year that I, I borrowed from, uh, from them. But on the vertical axis here, CO2 per tons of molten steel and percentage of ferrous scrap on the bottom axis. What I really want to focus on here is there's really just two clusters of the data. And what we're talking about here is really on the left is you got the blast furnaces and on the right, you got the electric arc furnaces. There's a three to 400% swing in the potential carbon footprint, depending on the type of mill where the material is coming from. And so there's a huge disparity in the steel industry. And once you start paying attention to this sourcing and the material, it, it, there, there absolutely starts changing uh, the, the complexity of the steel equation, but it's all about inventory control and uh, where, that, where that solution comes from. Now, great things happening here domestically. You have an electric arc furnace conversion that's happening. So you can start keeping that scrap local and there's more product that can be produced here. But I also understand even for a lot of your high quality steel that you're using here in New Zealand, a lot of it does today actually come from electric arc furnaces, whether they're coming out of Thailand, whether it's coming out of Korea, a lot of that is an electric arc material already but not always, let's start asking the question. What that does is that helps put pressure upstream in the system uh, in the mill, in, uh, the mills needing to react on this. Now, even if it's an electric arc furnace, old versus new, there's a lot of operational efficiencies that can start coming into these systems as well. It's pressure on the system, it's pressure on carbon to continually evolve and upgrade what we're doing. This is a graphic in North America, so the dynamic here may be slightly different from the EPA, but between 1960 to 2018, actually only about 50% of the ferrous metal in the United States that was being consumed actually was being recycled. Now, if it's a steel beam or it's rebar, that material typically is 100% recycled, what we do in the structure, because it's really big chunks of steel that's pretty pure material. It's easy, it's, it's high value recycling content. Those uh, cars, eh, most of the time that might be easier, but it's getting harder with all the plastics that are in them. But uh, refrigerators, toasters, tin cans, they're harder to track, they're harder to do. They're, there's, uh, so it's not economically advantageous to recycle them. That's why it's not 100% on the true material that's being recycled, even though buildings are typically at a very, very high level of recycling. What I'm showing here is there's still a lot of opportunity for more growth in what we do in the EAFs. Now, this is through 2018 because that's all the EPA had published. Currently in the US, it's about 65% of, of the recycled steel that's going into these EAFs. Nucor is actually seriously looking at going back and mining the landfills, especially the older ones where, where cars were being dumped for the steel that's in them for, for the, as the cheaper source of where to get more scrap to put into, into their mills. There's a lot of room in the recycling space to grow what we do in EAFs from what we do right now is, is, the, is the point. And most of the steel for our buildings, the rolled shapes, uh, the, the plate, uh, it's, it, it, the rebar, it's, it's usually has this potential to come from EAFs and uh, to be super high recycled amounts. Now, this was um, a recent project of mine, a steel office building that I did in San Francisco, about a 23-story office, steel frame, composite floors, BRB bracing, where I did a pretty detailed look at all the mill certs and where all the material came in. And I, I'll show you just a couple of these slides. Just A, steel is a global commodity in terms of where it comes from. Now, on this project, yes, 70% of the material is domestically rolled steel shapes that went into all the floor beams. 
but there's quite a bit of steel, some of it coming from ArcelorMittal, uh, directly from Europe's. The 211 tons also came from ArcelorMittal. It just came the other way around the globe to get to, get to Seattle, but it was kind of the, the higher grade steel in our columns. But what I really want to focus on there for a moment is that thousand tons that came from Russia. We had BRBs in this building. I had a very tight limit on the FY, the upper and lower bound of the, uh, the yield strength of those cores. The electric arc furnaces in the US couldn't meet that criteria. And so what the core brace, the, the BRB supplier was doing is they were buying ingots of blast furnace steel from Russia, bringing them in, remelting them, uh, and extruded them into the shapes and then cutting the cores out of that. And that's what was coming into our BRBs. And that's has been standard fare in, in the US market for a bit. And because core brace has like most of the market. Well, that steel from those cores is only 10% of the total steel in the project, but it was 50% of the carbon footprint of all the steel of the project, just because of the sourcing of where that came from. I never knew that, but once we found that out, um, started asking some questions. Started with first going to Nucor, who's one of the, big, the biggest suppliers in the US and saying, why aren't you producing these cores for us here? And finding out that my bound was so tight on the FY that they're, they're, they just couldn't operationally and efficiently do it. And so they just didn't bother. But uh, once they found out that they were actually losing market share to steel that was coming in, that they, it was a market they didn't have, they became quite incentivized because they weren't aware of, of this, this load, the steel path. And in fact, uh, there's a brand new steel mill in Brandenburg, Kentucky that Nucor is coming online with that has actually much better quality control abilities and the, the operational things that they could do in their mill. Turns out this new mill could meet the standards that we wanted for those cores. And I think we made like about a 3% change in the FY uh, of, of what we were doing, working with the metallurgists at Nucor. Point being now we can get our uh, braced frame cores out of an electric arc furnace in the US at a much, much lower carbon footprint than what had been happening in the industry. And that came from asking, from just tracking the information, asking the questions, learning from it, and then evolving to the next step. And you know, how that applies to the context here, j just think of it as an example, the type of questions you can and should be asking, and it'll take you on some journeys sometime, but it can be some really rewarding outcomes that come from that. Now, in New Zealand, for sure, you have some amazing, talented centers of excellence on this LCA space already. Your, uh, the CSOC uh, Sustainability Task Force, you have a group of people that, that know every, much everything of what I'm just talking about. They may not have it articulated and explained as well, but they're ex extremely passionate and talented on this topic. They have an internal resource, ask questions. Especially in the steel space, one of the values of steel is the reuse story, the adaptability and reuse. This guide that was written in 2009 by Alistair, it's as relevant today as when it was written in 2009. You have the roadmap. What we need to do more in, in the US is really the same way is we need to actually bring the base up, get everyone kind of understanding the information, and then actually start executing on the tools and the information that actually in many ways is already out there. Uh, and uh, this, I put this slide in just to make that point of, especially here in New Zealand, because of your tolerance control and quality standards, I think you have an industry that's well, well conditioned to make this step of, of monitoring and tracking. Uh, the, the system's already primed for it. Uh, to, to make the carbon ask, it's a different variable that comes into it, but 100% you have uh, a quality control process that you you can leverage that in this LCA conversation. In many ways, I could see New Zealand running with a topic like this and quickly moving ahead of some of the things that actually are even happening in Europe or um, in the United States, if there's the will there to do it. A um, couple of just tools to pay attention to. Australia, Australasia EPD is one of the, the better resources for getting EPDs created and uh, where to put the data here in the local market. AISC is a great resource in the US, what's happening. And then from the UK, SCI has a wonderful guide on the protocol for reusing steel and what we need to do to responsibly consider that, that, that reuse if we're bringing those in. They're just really good resources. 
Um, last note I want to leave you with on how fast this topic is moving and an accelerant that came into the system this year that even in the States, people don't really appreciate how much this is going to change things over the next couple of years. The U.S. is finally waking up and getting serious on this topic. And just earlier this year, the Department of Energy infused $6 billion into industrial decarbonization uh, projects, funding 33 different projects to look at how we're doing infrastructure to, to bring in, start to accelerate the advancement of hydrogen and the making of steel, accelerate lower carbon concretes and new types of cements coming into the system, accelerate uh, opportunities in aluminum and glass. Across the industry, this is happening. I think the uh, concrete industry got $1.6 billion for new plant development um, from the DOE just this year. The steel industry, I think, got $1.5 billion. Uh, a lot of that actually went to Cleveland Cliffs uh, for taking one of their direct reduction uh, furnaces and uh, looking at bringing hydrogen uh, into what we can do in that plant in Indiana and build it out over the next 10 years to try to make it a usable, get it to the point that we have a, a, an actionable plant that's doing that. And just last week, um, I was in Washington, D.C., and the EPA just announced $160 million that they've just put into the system to prop up a U.S. EPD system. And they did it in what I thought was an extremely uh, smart way is for the materials that they're going to put carbon numbers on, that they're going to track carbon through the EPA, steel, aluminum, glass, concrete. They gave grants of money to the trade organizations and the industry organizations that are responsible for that material. So AISC, uh, the equivalent of SC, SCNC, uh, in the U.S. just got $9 million to education, outreach, training standards on EPDs. And so the EPA has handed this money out to the organizations that are actually know their people, know their industry, and then they're tasking and challenging them with being the ones that kind of bring their industry into the system to be able to do this. So the, uh, this is an accelerant that's coming into the system, and this money's being handed out before the election. So regardless of what happens this fall, this is money that's in the system. And so my point being is, I think you're gonna see a lot more coming out of the US to accelerate on this. And I think what's exciting about that is just what that means at scale. I clearly think Europe is ahead of the US on many of these topics, on culturally how we're acting on it. But their problem is, is Germany and the UK and France can't agree on the standards. And so they all do something different and it's a big mess, but there's super motivation to act in the space, but you're going to see the U S in a really big way stepping into this. And so if you're sourcing from say Hyundai or mills in Southeast Asia that also service the U S market, if they don't have EPDs yet, they will very, very soon. Um, just because of, of, of if they want to be in that market where they need to do that, what that means is an echo one for you, how you guys can kind of leverage that. Um, I don't know where that goes, but just know that this is this is coming through the system. So, so in closure for the things we're talking about here, um, I just want to emphasize materials are independent. And LCA isn't about concrete versus steel versus timber versus something else. We need all of them. They're all precious resources. We need to optimize all of them, but they work together. And, I, and you need all of these to, to make a building, which we, this is what we typically do as structural engineers. We're working with all of these materials. Use each for what it does best. That's usually the, low, the best carbon place to start, even if the carbon data isn't quite accurate enough to tell you where to go. That's probably steel in tension and, and long span flexure. That's concrete at foundations. That's maybe timber for surface area when it works for fire or moisture conditions. That's a good starting point. Uh, and then kind of expand from that where it goes. Be intentional with your choices. Find the two for one, the three for one, the four for one solution. So when you put a material in, especially a carbon intensive material, make it do more than one job. That's value optimization. That's value driving for our clients, but that's also um, carbon optimization for what we're doing. Decide where to build for permanence and adaptability and be intentional of our choices, which we bring it in. I love performance-based engineering because that is that at its essence is an intentionality 
of, of, of making decisions on performance resiliency over time. It's not by accident that you happen into one of those positions. Hopefully we know what we're doing that has, has gotten us to those solutions. And then lastly, you know, life cycle analysis means time has to be in the equation, has to be in the conversation. And this is one we don't really have figured out yet. We're not in agreement on how the time gets used, but this is the building the ship as we go. Uh, lean into the problem, become part of the solution, uh, become an informed part of it and, and help inform the debate is frankly my, my suggestion. But holistic re LCA reporting, when you are looking at the whole story, it absolutely is gonna favor resiliency and longevity of buildings as being our most optimal um, uh, lower carbon solutions over time. Let me stop there. Uh, you have a homework assignment. Pull up the Heinz guide. Yeah. As I said, uh, when you go there online, you get a like a you know there's splashy PR video, but then you get a, access to this link where you can download it because their intent is to make this a free guide to just put it out there for how to make an owner decision making process out of it. This guide is being updated. We're writing the next version of it, um, and so hopefully that'll be out before the end of this year. Uh, so also look for some updates that are coming out of that. Let me, with that, stop uh, and open this up for any questions that you guys might have, uh, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Any questions? No? Okay. Thanks. Very insightful presentation. Um, just a quick question. I mean, you say we shouldn't yeah. compare. Uh, EPDs across materials yes. uh, with each other, but what's the alternative for a, a holistic LCA of a building? So if if we really, uh, the, the this data that's in the science right now, EPDs are not for comparing, but there are, res there are databases, life cycle inventory databases that are supposedly a life cycle expert has gone in and looked at the differences of the variances and have, have, have made comparisons. So like Gabby, as an example, that you would have access to inside of uh, the Tally software or uh, inside of OneClick. There are lifecycle inventory LCI databases that are out there. The problem with these LCI databases as it exists, they're black box, they're pay to play and they're black boxes. So you can go get some carbon numbers, but they don't necessarily tell you the assumptions that they've made on how they've dealt with some of these hard issues like the timber to the concrete to steel. They just give you a number. Um, many of them were written 10 years ago and they've had some updates and refinements in them, but um, the, uh, that's one of the reasons we created this EC3 tool in the database to begin with is because the black box nature of the LCI databases that are out there that are supposedly able to let us do these changes you don't really know what are some real, the, what assumptions they made on sometimes what are some really hard to deal with issues. Um, so that's the best that's out there. The other thing that I really tried to do with when we created the, e the EC3 database, which really is just the database of the EPDs, report the uncertainty that's in the data. So that when we, let's say you do an early comparison of the concrete to the steel to the timber building, and you use the best available science data as you can. And if you find the whisk that you find the number is 11, 12, and eight, plus or minus 400%, what decision does that let you make? You know, when the, when the whisker bars are just kind of that big of an overlap. The reality is most of the time, based on the quality of the data today, carbon data isn't mature and accurate enough to let us answer that question. It, that's in, in my deep looks of it, that's kind of where I've ended up right now. And so, or now at an academic level, uh, at, you know, and then after the fact, I can, I can go back in and do some really studies, but that data isn't actionable at the time that we're making designs where a lot of that information is today. There's a lot of misinformation in the data, but the real data isn't that actionable. So make your early design decisions for all the reasons we make early design decisions, but maybe carbon isn't, isn't the one you hang your hat on why you pick this one versus the other. Actually, I think the four for one solutions, if you're gonna put timber in the building, that's a great thing because it's visible, people like it, it's easy to look at, you don't have to put other finishes on it. 
But if I have to put timber in a building and then I have to cover it up and clad it so you don't see it, don't kid yourself that you're getting a lower carbon solution at the end of the day and pay, paid more money, but it's a lower carbon building. Not unless you know where it came from. <laughs> and so, so it's, it's, it depends, I guess is my, my answer for you. But the LCI databases are, are the place in life cycle accounting where you would try to make that quantification. Just report the uncertainty with your data at the same time and then make an informed choice from that if you can. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Sure. Just a, when you're talking about steel and where does it come from, really, really cool that you went into that detail about the um, Russian steel because, you know, I would see this product, it's from core brace, it's from the States, and I think, well, it's, you know, the whole of its cycle is based in the States. How far should you be looking into a product? Like where does that train stop? Is it like... You know, the section was fabricated here, but the ignits were over here. Well, yeah. do, do you keep going back to, like, the mining as well? I'm so, curious so about, that, yeah, how far you go. That study I did, that was a bit of an impassioned effort that, that was not normal to actually find the details all the way back. The, the way the system is supposed to work, you should just have to ask for the EPD, and that's all the farther you have to go. And the third-party verified EPD that comes through to you all of that detail has been reported all the way through it. And so as long as the EPD you get is valid and representative of the material that you're getting and, and you can do that alignment, you shouldn't have to look farther than that. Where it really comes down to a problem is, well, what if the EPD, what's, what if it's, you don't have an EPD, um, but you're still trying to make an evaluation, then that's where you have to start asking some questions. In a steel case for me, if you don't have an EPD, the question you really want to know is where's the mill? And if it's a blast furnace or an electric arc furnace, just go that far and then use the industry average for electric arc furnaces or the industry average for blast furnaces for, for the carbon number that you, you would use in there. I wouldn't go too much farther than that. Um, then, then it starts to get academic after that point. You have to keep a, look at mining. Everything is so far. Our cell phones are all mined. And there's some of that stuff you wouldn't want to buy a cell phone if you go far, too far back. So it, it, it's, it can be quite complicated. You know? It was quite interesting, sorry, to go aside where Greenpeace was talking about, hey, stop coal mining in New Zealand while holding a, a device that every single item in that phone is mined, um, yeah. and some from not nice places. The, the, where I think the data is most credible in this conversation is where you have a baseline, you've measured your building, and then you used to have the conversations of I'm um, 10% reduction, 30% reduction, measuring against myself um, of my own building, how much reduction or how much increase if I had. That's a very valid discussion to have in the data where it is right now. Or the like EPD comparisons, two concrete suppliers, two different EPDs, one's 20% below the other, but they cost the same. So, you know, that's that's... Usually what I honestly also see happening is cost is still the driver and it will be, but carbon is the tiebreaker. If, the, if you're within about 10%, that's, that's usually where most owners will make a decision. If, if you're 20% different, uh, unless it's, it's a really, really motivated owner, usually cost is probably still gonna be the driver. But if you got two designs come in or two suppliers and they're, Five percent difference on the cost, but there's a big carbon difference. That that should be the winner of, of who gets the project. That's usually how the data is getting used today. Yeah. All right. We'll just uh, finish the in-room questions, but we've got a couple oh. of online questions. Sure. Um, as a cost consultant, I'm trying to get my head around um, kilogram CO2 per square meter per year metric. If <laughs> sixty percent of the embodied carbon uh, spend is in year zero. How is normalizing that over 60 to 100 years giving us the right focus? We don't get to do that with Project CapEx dollar spend. Yeah, this is um, where I'm at on this is if we're doing life cycle analysis, time needs to be in the denominator. Where I'm at right now is stopping there because there's a lot of different ways in the industry and debate of how to do this. And I'm, I'm posing that as a challenge to the industry. We need to figure this out. Um, 
because I can think of two or three different ways I could say, go do it this way, but that's the world according to Don Davies. I'd really like it to be the world according to a consensus body that says, this is how we need to do those, those dollars. Um, I would say this, I do think um, carbon modeling tied to cost estimating is a huge potential. And in many ways, following the British standard, which you guys have here is a lot easier than in the US because we don't have QSs in the US. Uh, and so we don't have that independent QS uh, survey that's, that's done on the projects. So um, there, you know, there's differences on how that happens. But Procore, as an example, is doing a pretty deep dive right now of figuring out how in their cost estimating software to essentially have another column next to where there's a summing up the dollars where they're, they're trying to put carbon into the equation and then tie that into some of these uh, databases like EC3 or a database that OneClick has to start bringing that information into, as you develop a cost model to describe your building, you can develop a carbon model at the same time that evolves and gets more refined and better with time as we describe the building. I think that's a very elegant way to get better with these numbers. Now, the issue of time, do you measure it 60 years? Do you amortize it to one year? Um, I've seen it done four different ways. And they both come up with a number that is reasonable. But the problem is four different ways, it's four different numbers. I can't take those four numbers and put them together and try to make any sense out of them. And so uh, I, I'll just leave it as this is one of those topics that the LCA gurus of the world, and um, I'm part of a committee in those things, we need to get on the same page of, of this topic and we need to put, this is the next guidance that we really need to put out there. Thanks, Don. We'll finish with one last question. You mentioned that blast versus electric arc being the key difference. Is this on the assumption that the energy source is renewable? Um, uh, so, so part of it is you have to go in and kind of understand how blast furnaces work. Uh, 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 the energy, absolutely, it's about the energy source and, and, and what that is. Um, blast furnaces, by and large, most of them are coal-driven as the, as the energy feedstock because of the heat that they're trying to generate out of those. It's one of the reasons that the, the, it's a four times, 400% difference. It's, you need more energy that goes into the system when it, you're working with the raw materials, but then just the, the energy for heat. Generally, is it's a lot of coal and natural gas, but especially coal that's going into it. We're an electric arc furnace. It's absolutely about the what's powering the electrical grid, and that flows through in the EPD. And this is one of the challenges Nucor had in the U.S. They're the 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 big U.S. supplier for most of the country. The steel mill in Seattle is all hydropower driven, and it's got a really really low carbon footprint. Some of the lowest carbon steel that you can get in the country. But their next closest mill in Utah, I'll use Powder Mountain Coal for all the electricity from a coal-fired generation plant that drives that plant. It's some of the dirtiest steel from their electric arc furnaces. And they were they had this own internal struggle of, well, wait a minute, if I tell the good story, that means I got to tell my bad story. Um, but that's exactly what we want to come through the system. And it helps bring pressure on the industry to those non-renewable sources like the coal-fired generation to get Nucor starting to buy renewable energy credits to get them to invest in solar and wind and, and uh, for the power that's going there. As the grid decarbonizes, absolutely, this starts to flow through in the numbers. And it's one of the ways that the steel number continues to come down if it's electricity that is the primary feedstock uh, that's, that's, that's making the steel. But that's really the big difference between the electric arc and the blast furnace. And Kevin, maybe you can answer it better beyond that better than me. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we'll leave it for conversation for another day. Okay. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much, Don. Um, okay. Very informative. And so let's put our hands together. All right. Thank you.